Can you hear me up the back of this volume? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Can you hear me now up the back of this volume? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Question and answer yes. over. Um, my name is Pasha Lee Steakham. I am a lecturer in classics at the University of Melbourne here. Um, and I'm tasked with taking you through some of the themes and ideas uh, of book eight. Now, I'll start by saying that, of course, in the time I have with you, 35, maybe 40 uh, minutes or so, I can only be very, very selective. Um, so I'm going to try and just pick out a few things that perhaps, in some cases, you haven't had an opportunity to discuss in class while you've been focused, of course, on understanding the text and translating uh, the text. Um, so if you bear with me for half an hour, 40 minutes, I'll take you through hopefully some useful material for your exam. And if you do find yourself losing concentration in honour, of book eight, I have laced the presentation with eight typos that you can look for and identify to go, at least they're just the ones I'm aware of, so they might be more than eight, but let's see how it goes. When you're focusing on a text like the Aeneid, and particularly when you're trying to come to terms with it, um, as a foreign language to translate it, to focus on things like literary techniques, I think sometimes it's very easy for us to lose focus on exactly how relevant and how modern in some ways the Aeneid can be. Some of that I think really comes to the fore um, in book eight, although perhaps some elements of the language seem very archaic and very unusual um, to us. And it's hard, some of the themes speak to a lot of concerns right now um, in this country globally and so on. So I, some of the language I want to use in talking about the key themes, is trying to draw some of that out perhaps. Now I have been informed and I hope it is accurately informed that these are the key passages that you need to look at for the exam. If I hadn't been, well I hope you enjoy the next few minutes, hopefully it's entertaining in some ways um, and you'll get something out of it. Uh, but I am going to focus in what I'm discussing very much on these passages. Hopefully a lot of what I am pointing you to is relevant to the book as a whole and you can take with you through your journeys uh, with Virgil and the Aeneid generally, but I am going to try and be quite specific and to start to some degree at the beginning because I think that initial passage that you've been given, and particularly um, the, the conversation, the encounter with the dream Tiber in dream form, speaks to some of the central concerns of the epic as a whole, and, and in particular things that come out elsewhere in, um, in book eight. Because really, to a large extent, book eight is about finding home. And this last part of the Aeneid as a whole is about establishing home. In the encounter with Tiber, though, what we see in essence is the land itself, or an aspect of the land itself, talking to this newcomer Aeneas, who himself comes from elsewhere, or at least on the surface comes from elsewhere. He's an immigrant, as we might say. He's a refugee, to be more specific, coming to a land which, to some extent, and particularly at this point in the epic, of course, is seeming to be rather hostile to newcomers. And it's at that moment, at a moment when he's feeling the burden, when he's struck with the anxiety of that um, endeavour of establishing himself in, himself in a new and somewhat hostile land, that he falls asleep and Tiber comes to him in the form of a dream. And a form, of course, not just simply by the fact that he's a river god, but also in some of the ways that Tiber is described here, some of the very uh, natural imagery, some of the ways in which, of course, he's, he's decked with elements of, of uh, flaxen robes when he has frond-like hair. He is made from the land and that's redolent in the way he's described. If you think about how someone coming from elsewhere actually establishes their place um, in a new homeland, you can see here how, and of course the words of Tiber themselves are designed to be reassuring about um, Aeneas's and of course his followers, the Trojans as a whole, place uh, in the new land, talking in terms of Donald's, talking in terms of this Curta Domus, this, this fixed and certain home that they've found there actually being able to speak directly to the land that you're now establishing yourself in, and not just you, of course, the generations of your people um, to come, is a, is a very evocative and quite direct way of figuring that, that idea. 
But more than that, and I think emphasising, and so perhaps I suspect something you picked up on in your own reading of um, the text, to really emphasise that sense of home, this of course in Aeneas's case by Tiber is represented as somewhat of a homecoming. Now in that uh, line specifically, and I'm thinking here about lines 36 uh, and 7, um, it's drawing here on a, uh, an element of, of the myth where um, Dardanus, who is a mythical founder of Troy, of course, and the Trojan people, actually in the account that we're given in the Aeneid, came from, originated himself from, um, from Italy. So Dardanus in some ways was an immigrant to Troy and now Aeneas is, is coming back. So you have that establishment of home to some degree figured as a homecoming as well through this um, embodiment of and representation of uh, the land. There's another way of thinking about this, uh, of course, and that's potentially in terms of legitimacy. Um, establishing a, a, a legitimate uh, claim to homeland too, as a people who've come from um, elsewhere. There were many different ways of expressing the origins of people, the origins of communities in the ancient world. A, a, a very different way from the way the Romans did it, uh, that you might be aware of, for instance, is the origin myth of Athens, which is an autochthonous origin myth, where they, they saw their people of having arisen from the earth itself as always being there. Now that, of course, is itself a very direct way of establishing um, a connection with place and legitimacy in terms of your occupation of the, the land. On the face of it, Aeneas and the Trojans don't have that. They come from, from elsewhere. Why should that be allowed by the Rutulians or anyone else to establish themselves in this land? And of course, there's a number of different ways in which that legitimacy in the poem is established. The support of the gods, of course, being central to that. Also, of course, the claim that in some ways it is a, a, a return. But this adoption, almost, by the land itself is another important part of that, I think. Or a, a way of representing it, at the very, very least. Now, all of that is not to say that the establishment of, of Aeneas in Italy is not ringed round with um, all sorts of anxieties. And if you think of, of uh, the depiction of Aeneas in, uh, I would claim the epic as a whole, but certainly book eight, um, as an immigrant, as, as a refugee, you have quite different responses um, figured in, in the passages you're looking at, in fact, from book eight to the, the newcomer, to the, the, the immigrant. On the one hand, of course, obviously um, you have conflict because book eight is very much at the heat of the outbreak of, of the war. And that's going to go on for, for several books, and it's going to be very, very uh, destructive. So the newcomer being met with, with conflict is very much at the forefront of Aeneas's mind, of course, uh, in Book 8. And it's, it's the point we really start from and never really completely lose in the rest of the, uh, of the epic. But at the same time, there's elements of hospitality and welcome in Book 8 too. In fact, it's not just Book 8. We have seen some of that earlier with the initial um, contacts with uh, Latinus and so on. But in Book 8 in particular, it's centred around the welcome by um, Evander or initially actually Pallas, um, who welcomes uh, Aeneas and the Trojans, strangers, complete strangers who just kind of paddled down, or paddled up actually, um, the Tiber and turned up out, out of nowhere. And this kind of immediate establishment of, of, of guest friendship with, um, with Aeneas and the Trojans contrasts quite strongly with that alternative, very hostile um, response that Aeneas has just immediately encountered before. And it's, it's, it's quite significant ju juxtaposition in uh, Book 8, of course. Now, Evander and his people, and it's significant in this, I think, Evander and his people have actually shared the experience, both of being immigrants, but more specifically being refugees. And um, I might come back to that a little bit later. But it is an anxious time for Aeneas, and look out in the text for the ways in which uh, the anxiety around establishment in a new place, around being an outsider, and about outsiders to some extent, is expressed in Book 8. I've just highlighted a few elements of anxiety that, that surface briefly, but notably, I think, in um, Book 8. Of course, Aeneas at the very, very start, very early in your section, 
um, very early in, in, in Book 8, when he falls asleep, and, and part of the context for the reassurance by, by Tiber and the, the, the welcoming and encouragement that Tiber, um, in the form of a dream, brings, is that Aeneas is anxious, um, that he's feeling the, the anxiety that's been caused by the conflicts he's currently faced with. It's interesting too, if you look at that, that initial reception that I was just kind of flagging as an example of hospitality and welcome, that initial reception by the Arcadians, um, Evander's people, um, which I probably should call them Evander's people rather than Arcadians per se at this point. Pallas is very welcoming, but the rest of the Arcadians, their initial response is one of anxiety, is fearful. Here come unknown figures on the river, they're bearing arms as well, which doesn't help things. And you get the sense of a community that is used to being under threat. We've actually already been told, I can't recall off the top of my head if it's in one of your passages or not in Book 8, but certainly in Book 8, it is in fact, Tiber emphasises it, that um, a bandist community itself has been met with conflict in this new land. They, as refugees and immigrants, have not been received universally hospitably um, by those who, who were there. So, to some extent, you could almost see that anxiety that they express when they see Aeneas um, and his, his friends on the, on the Tiber as a conditioned response, conditioned by the conflict that they've found, too, as immigrants to this land. It's interesting that it, that translates to, to Venus as well, or at least her motivation, as it's described, for a scene, of course, an element of Book 8 that I'll spend a bit of time on in a few moments, which is uh, the, the, the armour of um, Aeneas, her motivation for in getting Vulcan to make that, is actually described as being fear. Now this is despite the fact that on more than one occasion it's been emphasised to, to Venus that everything is going to be alright, including by Jupiter, Jupiter himself. She's still anxious. So you have this <coughs> overarching sense of anxiety and, and concern around the establishment of uh, these people in this new land as well. And not just anxiety and concern on Aeneas and the Trojans' part, but interestingly, Evander's people too. And it's to the encounter with Evander, Evander in particular, but Evander's people generally, that I want to spend a little bit of time now. Because, of course, that is not interesting simply as an encounter of two people striking a treaty, striking kind of negotiation, resolving potential conflict through negotiation and of, of providing a hospitable welcome on the part of, of Pallas and the, the Arcadians themselves. But it's also highly significant because of the form that the hospitality for Aeneas takes. He's given um, a very, very descriptive um, tour of the area that will one day become Rome. And more than that, to, to, to a large extent, initially, even before he really gets to, to the tour around the, the area, he's given a little bit of a tour of history by Evander, of what came before. And this is, is one of the most interesting things about Book 8's uh, account of, of the area of, uh, of Rome and, and Aeneas's first ventures. Um, uh, around the side of Rome is that there's this constant and persistent sense that things came before. There's always something that's come before and in, as Amanda described it, quite a great deal, in fact, um, that has come before. And a great deal of that parallels, to some extent, the experience of Aeneas himself. Actually, the experience of Amanda. Mm -hmm. It starts, to some extent, with Saturn. Saturn, who is described as coming to the area of Latium, the area around Rome that Rome is within, as himself an exile. So this is Saturn coming to the area as himself a refugee, someone from outside, or a god um, from uh, outside, uh, chucked out by um, Jupiter. Now, in that little passage where Evander is describing, the, and I'll, I'll come back to it under another guise too because it's interesting in terms of how the period when Saturn was in, in control of the area, inhabited the area is described, and I'll come back to some of that detail, but for now I just kind of uh, uh, observe that there's an interesting parallel there, actually 
not explicitly made between um, and, uh, Saturn and Aeneas, but actually made fairly explicitly, I think, between Saturn and Evander. Have some water there. Because the description of past history that Evander provides starts with Saturn and effectively ends with a statement of how Evander and his own people got there. And lo and behold, they too were driven out from their original homeland. So, and there's a couple of different ways of, of seeing this. I've, I've kind of framed it in terms of parallel. You could actually see this in terms of cycle to some extent as well. And, and a number of, uh, of scholars looking at not just this, but other elements of the Aeneid have been really interested in the way that perhaps um, the poem works to map a sort of cyclical uh, pattern to, to, to history. But that's just one way of seeing it. But out of that, of course, and one of the little incidental details, the incidental detail I've called Apparently, incidentally, how I picked out from line 322, um, three I think is emblematic. The name of Latium is derived in this account from its provision of sanctuary, from hiding away Saturn. And it's, that it's Saturn who names it that, but the same could be said of what it does for Evander when he's driven out of his homeland. And this sense of Latium, and of course Rome within it, being a sort of sanctuary for those who have come from elsewhere under dire circumstances, and Aeneas of course is a refugee from the destruction of his original community in, in Troy, is very, very strongly emphasised in the uh, Evander sequence in Troy 8. But the other interesting aspect, as I mentioned, of the account of um, Saturn's time, in Latium is the detail we've provided about uh, the society at the time, or really his establishment of society. Now, Evander goes on to call these kind of golden centuries, this golden um, uh, age, and so it's drawing upon, to some extent, drawing upon, by the time that Virgil is writing, some fairly traditional ideas about the sequence of deep history um, and uh, progression or decline and so on. But it also conveys the, 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 the golden age of Saturn, the Saturnian age, in a way that's a little different from sometimes how this age of gold is represented elsewhere. And the, the other, um, if you're interested, the, the kind of locus classicus for um, the, the, the age of gold or the race of gold, the, the earliest one is, is the work of archaic Greek poet Hesiod. And it's different from that, because this is not a time where everything comes easily. Uh, where no one needs to work, you don't really need law, you don't really need um, any kind of uh, discipline and rule, there's no real social hierarchy, um, goods flow naturally and people live off the natural world and so on, which is perhaps more aligned with the Hesiodic version of the Golden Age. But this is a time when actually it's golden, it's prosperous, it's successful because of Saturn's application of social rule, law, and so on. And that's quite explicitly. It's a different kind of golden age requiring society and also, um, of course, requiring uh, rulership. And this is one of those points, and, the, and there are many, many throughout the Aeneid where uh, a lot of readers would think, well, here we have something that perhaps has a somewhat political uh, message behind it in terms of the need for strong and um, centred leadership in order to provide um, prosperity and success and, and so on, and to see this very much in an Augustan uh, period framework in the establishment of the Principate, and I think that's a legitimate way of seeing it. But in the broader picture that Evander paints of um, pre aeneid history in, in Italy, that's not all there is to it. He actually goes on to describe several waves, really, of peoples who have come to Italy. It's kind of this, this serial immigration um, to uh, Italy, and uh, he conveys it in a very, well, a couple of interesting ways. One is this sense, kind of coming off that representation of, of the Saturnian age as a golden one, a sense of, of potential decline, which is sort of the point where he starts this account from but also the sense, perhaps, that there is a loss of memory that goes on with this. One of the really interesting lines here, um, 
for me anyway. One of the interesting ones is the one I've marked in, in red, this idea that names are forgotten. It's actually, of course, kind of not true because Evander is telling us in reasonable detail about the past. So the Norman is not completely um, forgotten. But what he actually says is that on many occasions it was forgotten. Now, the other side, the correlative of that is that many occasions it was picked up again. It was put aside and then it was picked up and then it was put aside and then it was picked up. And he, of course, is telling the story. Is that a suggestion that perhaps the opportunity for this sort of a, a golden age is cyclical, it can return? And I'm not simply here thinking of a single return, and a lot of, of, of people have argued that there's a, these, this and other things are references to the Augustan period itself that Virgil's writing in being envisaged as a golden age. But the idea is, is, is one of recurrence, as well as recurrence of forgetting, as well as remembering, potentially here, within this, this um, other model of decline and these waves of contributors to Italy for good and for bad. So moving on through the journey, that, uh, or the little tour, I suppose, the tour that Evander takes um, Aeneas on. Of course, you have a very, very persistent, very explicit comparison of um, the present of the characters in the epic, what I've, I've called here the mythic past, which really actually I'm talking about the, the, the period that's dramatized in, in um, the epic of Evander and and Aeneas, and uh, the Roman present, and I mean present here from the point of view of Aeneas and his uh, original readers, which of course is the future from the point of view of Aeneas and uh, Evander. Ah, and in doing that, very often the, this passage of Book 8 is pointing to the beginnings. You will see references to, to things which then became something usually more elaborate in the Roman present. So it's a very ideological, it's a term kind of used in this in this context, it's a very ideological passage. For those of you who haven't come across this, ideology has come from the Greek term aition, which means origin. It's a, a telling about the origins of various locations, topographical, to some extent institutional as well, because there's religious rituals and so on. Um, embedded within it, that the Romans would know very well themselves in Virgil's own day. So it's a, it's a, it's a deeply ideological um, passage. And one of the things that, well, there's two things. I'm going to highlight two things that are interesting to think about. And I, to some extent, some extent actually, I, pro I think this probably applies to any ideological exploration in ancient literature or just kind of myth generally. The what, what first thing is that very often in ideology, the origins of something are thought to be very telling about the essential nature of that thing. So one of the, the, the questions I'd ask you to think about when you're looking at this passage is what are these origins, this early period, this pre-Roman period of the site that will become Rome, what is this suggesting, if anything, about the Rome that will come, the way in which this mythic um, uh, past is being represented. The other um, thing I'd encourage you to think about, and this always plays out, of course, when you're comparing a, a deep mythic past with a, a, a present, is what is similar, what is different? What are the points of continuity, if any? And what are the differences? And what are the quali what's the qualitative nature of that difference? What is, is that difference telling us? And there are some very, very significant differences that are, are Hugely emphatic, I think, and there's a, only a couple I'll draw your attention to. But one of them, in the, the highlighted by these couple of passages, is the contrast between um, wealth and relative poverty, or I wouldn't say poverty; I'd probably say simplicitas, simplicity. Evander and suppose the, the, the form that his settlement takes, his people, are representing, you saw him there referred to as Calpera, of course, as, as being poor, so um, uh, maybe poverty is not too far off the mark, but they're certainly represented as living a life of simplicitas. Alongside that, I mean, that, that to some extent you could just say, okay, it's a, it's a simple contrast between, oh, it's all simple and it's all kind of rural and 
in the future it'll be all built up and it'll be all kind of rich and wealthy and powerful and what you've got is kind of power and, and lack of power being juxtaposed and so the, the journey towards that power is at the forefront of the representation so being emphasized how, look how far Rome has come so it would be a simplistic way of putting that but at the same time the simplicitas of Evander is morally coded it's morally positive in a number of ways um, and, and I think this would be very, very true in a kind of a Roman cultural context and picked up by, by the readers, but you can probably see some of that in your own reading, in the, in the various references to the almost um, instinctive piety of Evander and his people, to the imminent um, uh, powers and, and deities of the land. Yeah, it's referred to at a number, on a number of occasions. So this complicates a little bit, I think, and complicates in a very in a way which, if you, you ever have the opportunity to read more deeply in Roman texts and particularly Roman sources of the first century BC, you'll become very very familiar with this sort of tension. That the sense that well, yes, you do have the, the journey, the contrast is one of improvement, in increase in power, increase in wealth, things that could potentially be seen as positive, but at the same time, the question of what has been lost is raised. Has there been a, a simplicity, which is a more morally positive one potentially, been lost in the journey to empire and greatness and power and so on? And I think Evander, generally speaking, I think this is, is true, I think Evander's Evander himself, but um, uh, his people and his settlement in uh, Aeneid Age is represented almost unambiguously positively in a number of, of different ways. But that is that is a, 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 a land that is lost. I mean, in some ways, quite literally lost. That is that's what it, what's at stake. Palantium, the settlement of of Evander, occupies the site of Rome. For Rome to exist, Evander, his people must cease, at least in the form they are, and there's some, uh, our, our sources are, are frustratingly fragmentary about this, but there, 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 there's some indication the idea is that the, the Arcadians are absorbed in some way into the people who will become Rome. But essentially, this is a, um, a simplicitas and, and a, a community that will be lost so that Rome can grow on the spot, in due course. Not immediately and not in the course of this poem, of course, but in due course. And it's interesting from that point of view that even in this supposedly pristine area that will become Rome, that has barely been touched, yet will be hugely be built up eventually, you've already got ruins of past buildings and monuments that um, are still there as memories, importantly there as memories, but have been lost and are now themselves ruins. I hope you're picking up the typos. I want to move on and I want to finish, more or less, more or less finish, uh, with talking a little bit about the, of course, the shoe of the Is it one of the most ironic statements in all of Latin literature is that non venerable um, bit, because of course then he goes on at great length to tell us all about it. Um, but, uh, and of course, this is, in some ways, this is a classic uh, ekphrasis, it's a description of a, a particular work of art, the term is used a bit more broadly than that, but essentially work of art. Famously, it, it does draw intertextually on the model of the description of the shield of Aeneas in Iliad 18. You don't need to be, um, be told that. It's also uh, interesting, this might be a little bit more obscure on first reading. Um, it's referred to as a clicus. Now, this is a type of shield, it's a round shield, um, that uh, is also significant at the time or around the time that oh, really? Virgil is writing because it, uh, such a shield had been given as an honorific by the uh, by the, the Senate of Rome to uh, Augustus uh, probably around 27 BC so about the time he took on the name Augustus actually um, uh, representing the various virtues associated with uh, the princess. Now, so possibly, possibly, um, there are some, again, contemporary parallels or some comparisons of mythic past and Roman present that are evoked in the shield taking even the form 
it takes and being described with the vocabulary it's described with. I won't go into huge details about what those parallels might be. I'm sure you've had a chance to discuss them. But they're certainly worth uh, drawing upon. Um, and uh, again, this is not about the Iliad in any way, but it's interesting to, to, to think about uh, what's often called Virgil's model for the shield of Aeneas. The shield of, uh, of Achilles effectively represents, in um, kind of microcosm in some cases, the, the whole universe. It's ringed round by ocean, or the whole, the whole world, I should say, not the universe, the whole world. Um, Whereas you could claim that the shield of Aeneas represents Rome, and Rome is being identified on the shield itself, I think, in several key ways, but also in terms of that intertextual um, uh, illusion and what it's, it, it means, is being identified essentially with the whole world or the whole universe. <coughs> it's also, of course, and I won't have time to go into this, but it's also, uh, very importantly, it's the work of an artisan, Vulcan himself. and. Um, this is the point in Book 8 that you get a, in other places very uh, obviously in the Aeneid where the poem is actually very interested in art and the power of art and, uh, and art in the broader sense of arte, not just um, kind of painting and sculpture and, and, and music and so on, but uh, artisanship as well. But, um, that in itself is, a, as I said, being selective um, today, that's another thing that will take some time more. So I'm not going to go through everything by any means that we have on um, uh, the shield blow by blow, although I encourage you to do that and think about each, each element, of course. Um, and you could say, broadly speaking, there's a lot of pictures of conflict, there's a lot of pictures of war that fit very well for it being armour, for it being a tool within the context of war. I'm not going to go into that. It's One of the interesting things is that it, it, it shows a picture of Rome, um, I won't say warts and all, because of course it's not the all, but it shows a, a morally mixed. It doesn't shy away from showing um, elements that it doesn't just pick, paint a rosy picture in other words of, of Rome. It shows some of the elements that are questionable, at least, such as um, the rape of the Sabine women, Sine More, um, or you would say were not highlights of Roman civil discourse, such as the Catalinian conspiracy and so on. So it's interesting that it, it mixes that in. But the main section of the description of the shield, and as it's described, the main section of the shield itself, of course, um, concerns Actium, concerns the, the essential conflict, which at least as it was represented after 32, finally established the dominance of um, Octavian Augustus itself. It's represented importantly, and, and look at how it's working to represent two sides. It's very much, it's not, it's not on two sides of the shield, sadly, or the metaphor would work perfectly, but it represents the two sides of the conflict in very opposing ways, as a kind of diametrical opposite. In the context of what Aeneas is currently trying to do in establish himself in Italy in the face of a quite now by the time we're in Book A, quite divided Italy, the representation of the Roman side as being uh, effectively all of Italy, as being the Italians, is significant and telling for the, 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 the story of Aeneas too. But the, the, the most striking thing, and the thing that's always pointed to here, is essentially you have the opposition, represented Egyptians and um, those from the, 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 the east, these represented as barbarians being represented in a, as the Roman other, as the opposite of what the Italians and the Romans represent. So it, it works to create, to project a very particular type, very particular late first century BCE type in fact, of Roman identity within that Augustus front. Augustus, of course, in ways you don't need to be told, is central to the account of Actium that we get um, on the shield. It ends, of course, with this sense of universal um, submission to Roman Augustus and spreads out across the world, which raises questions about where, and questions that, I should say, raises questions that have been raised in Book 8 about the nature of, of, of history, particularly his, Italian history, but global history as well, this idea of, of, of uh, or this question of whether there's cycles, this question of whether you can have recurrences, and so on, take on a, a very kind of interesting shade by the time we get to the end of the shield, because 
do we see the way the shield presents the triumph of actium and the establishment of universal Roman rule as the end point of those cycles, as in terms sounds incredibly outdated now, but it used to be quite popular at the beginning of this millennium. Um, is it the end of history? Are we getting an image of the end of history? Things have come to a telos, to an end point. Or is the sense that, well, this is just another point, albeit potentially a high point, in more yet to come, in just a, another wave of the cycle? And finally, and of course, it's a very appropriate point to end on, really. Um, although, if I've got a bit of time, I might um, just quickly fl flash through some, some imagery. Um, this idea at the very, very end, this famous line at the end of um, Book 8, where this, the, the great responsibility that Aeneas is lifting upon his shoulders for history to come is matched with significantly limited knowledge. The idea that responsibility exceeds knowledge. What you might be responsible for, another way maybe of thinking about it, what, you might, what might be the consequences of action, exceed in his case, what he always exceed in the greater view of history, what he can understand, what he's aware of. Um, now, just to finish off, and I won't spend any time whatsoever on this, but um, I, I do want you, in your readings, when you're thinking about this and thinking about the passages you get on, on the exam and so on, um, look for the imagery that's used. And I think in many cases they do align with some of the themes, I hope they align, with some of the themes that they're pointing to, even the odd ones. And I think to some extent, perhaps, uh, and certainly this was my impression when I first read it way back when, um, this seems a very odd simile, this, this famous simile that's used at 407 to 15 of Vulcan waking up to get to work and he's described as a woman working as, as a weaver, um, getting the, 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 the business ready to, to go and you go, what's going on here? You've got this big kind of fiery god of, of, the, of, uh, of the smith. Um, coming and being described in this way as, as a weaver. And yes, there is a sort of a parallel with that element of artisanship um, that I mentioned earlier. But the piece that interests me is the motivation that's given to the weaver. And the motivation here, which is to essentially secure and maintain a chaste home and also the legacy of her children. Now that is, I think, can be quickly look, overlooked and seen as a throwaway, but of course in the context of what Aeneas is doing, and hopefully the plan is, or Venus's plan is very much, will achieve through the arms that are being fashioned, that makes a great deal of sense. And, and finally, it wouldn't be a discussion of the Aeneid without pointing you towards imagery of fire, because there's a lot of fire um, in the Aeneid. I don't want to say terribly much because I've run out of, out, out of time, but um, I just note, of course, the association of fire with Vulcan is, is multifaceted, in fact, because partly the imagery of fire is used, as it often is in ancient texts, in Roman texts, and Virgil in particular, to uh, denote desire. Um, yeah. uh, and the armour itself, of course, is invested with some of that, that fire. It's, it's only just kind of gently pointed to but certainly has that sense of, of fire. And I, 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 I encourage you to think about that too, actually, the, the connection between um, the fire and desire here and, and what part desire actually plays, not simply in Vulcan's motivation, his manipulation to some extent by Venus to create um, the arms, but maybe in what the arms represent about the Roman future too. And what Venus is thinking about sure. Thank you so much for your time. I know I've taken up quite a bit of time. I still feel, though, that that's a bit of a whirlwind <coughs> trip um, through some very, very complex passages of people's take. And I can only end, as I began, by reiterating and to some extent apologising <coughs> for the fact that this is very selective. And the last thing that I'd ask you to do is also, of course, think, look for your own themes and ideas. See what you can see. There's plenty I haven't discussed. There's plenty still to be discovered. That's why we're still reading this text even now, so many years after it was written. Thank you very much, everyone, and best of luck to you.